yeah, it, it's the last kind of great stipulation. They gave the shield every advantage that you could possibly have. I compared it when we did the review of it to The Sixth Sense. Well, the biggest reason is evolution. His character always changed as the years went on. Brett is grumpy, Sean's a prick, and Vince was wrong. I remember I was watching when Bischoff started talking about the Elimination Chamber, and it seemed like a big mess. The concept, like they had, I remember they had like the graphics, like the blueprint, and I was like, am I supposed to figure out what the hell that thing looks like with the blueprint? And then he's talking about pods and people coming out of pods. I remember being very young when this was introduced, and I remember them making it, it seemed like it was Eric Bischoff's big grand idea. I remember watching the video packages for this and thinking, man, this is so cool. This is the best invention ever. Yeah, it, it's the last kind of great stipulation, I think, that WWE have created. It's phenomenal. Maybe money in the bank. Maybe money in the bank. When I first saw the Elimination Chamber, I was pretty blown away by it. Like when I started watching wrestling, it was 1998. The Hell in a Cell was still a relatively fresh concept, but I still was hungry as a fan to see what else they could do to push the envelope and try and just think outside the box in terms of match concepts and like what kind of structures they can come up with. So when I saw the chamber in its full completed form, when I saw them, you know, actually perform in the in the chamber itself for the matches, especially in 02, I was pretty enthralled with it. I loved the concept of combining, you know, like the war games element the rumble element and a big cage structure to you know really add to the severity of the situation in those matches i think it was a pretty cool concept so 2002 uh survivor series was the first ever elimination chamber match which is remarkable in itself but i think the moment that like what, what really the story running through this was that this was Shawn michaels's big return from wrestling he'd been out of a back injury he returned to wrestling with this new attitude that was supposedly no longer the sort of egomaniac that uh, was part of the Montreal screw job, which we'll get to in a bit. But it, it was it was this new version of Shawn Michaels. Shawn Michaels winning the first uh, Elimination Chamber match, organised of course by my dad. Um, it was great. I just wish he hadn't done it in brown tights. Worst tights he's ever worn. Those tights. Also the worst hair he's ever had. Altogether, presentation of Shawn Michaels on that one night, kind of the big night since he came back. It was terrible, terrible hair and terrible tights. Horrible poo tights. Really good match though. Bloody L Triple H wrestling with a crushed throat. The first ever Elimination Chamber match uh, and Shawn Michaels winning it. <sighs> this may get me some heat. I'm not, I, Shawn Michaels is great. Like he is one of the greatest of all time. I'm, but I'm not a Michaels guy. I was a Bret Hart guy. So, yeah, like Michael's coming back and winning the title. Like it was a great moment and everything, but like, yeah, come at me. Shawn Michaels winning seemed to be the only option that made sense. You know, at the time, Shawn coming back and winning the championship was a real cool feel good moment. And uh, I think that, you know, having not watched his first run until many years later, watching it, you know, in hindsight for reviews and stuff, I think that Shawn's second run easily surpasses his first in a lot of different ways. Like he may not have won as many titles, but he was still like the man. And he was still so good at what he did. Like he was older, he was wiser, he was still able to do a lot of what he did in his first run and just do it better. I think you know, that time away made him a better performer ultimately. Michael's winning as well. So not only have you got the, the Chamber match, you've also got Michael's after that excellent SummerSlam bout with Triple H. And you're like, okay, well that that was maybe a, a one-off, but he, he just got better and better and better. And I, I maybe it's because I wasn't watching in real time the michaels run unfold in the 90s but i was in the noughties and those wrestlemania performances hell yeah the greatest one of if not the greatest performers in the history of wrestling Shawn michaels if his back was fine and he was he had his head on straight absolutely he deserved a second reign uh, or a second run a hundred percent a thousand percent yes and then there's this brilliant moment right at the end where Triple H goes for a pedigree and Sean kicks out on the exact last moment because the man selling is on point for the whole match. Um, he is just selling up a storm as he's getting this ridiculous beatdown. You just remember that that's, that is one of Shawn Michaels' 
best things. No, never mind all the flips and the athleticism and all the kind of charisma. His selling is next level. The debut of The Shield, man. Like, The Shield were brilliant. The Shield are, without a doubt, the best WWE faction in the last 15 years. I mean, it's got to be up there. I don't know if there's been a stable that has had as much success on an individual level as much as The Shield did. Now, The Shield debuting at Survivor Series 2012, for me, that's probably right when I was at like my peak of wrestling interest. I was still riding the wave from Money in the Bank 2011 and I was still all into what Punk was doing. So I was super invested in this match. And then Survivor Series 2012, these three lads show up and you kind of suddenly like, oh, okay, what the, all right, we've got these three new guys here. It's it's Roman Reigns and it's Seth Rollins, it's Dean Ambrose. And if you're watching, like here in the UK, we used to get NXT. So if you're watching it, you're like, oh, okay, I, I kind of know these guys because I've seen them periodically. Like, you know, Rollins was an NXT champion. Reigns didn't really do a great deal. I don't even think Ambrose even made it onto NXT TV. He made that like once or twice or so. I remember watching the Shield debut and made quite the impact. And I was like, who are these three guys in the mock turtlenecks? Uh, you know, destroying everything. And at the time, I didn't really watch NXT. I did not know what FCW was. Um, I didn't really pay attention to independent wrestling like I do now, so I had absolutely no clue who any of those three gentlemen were. Um, but as, you know, we all got to know them, um, became uh, fans of theirs. So when the Shield attack Ryback and Cena during the triple threat match with CM Punk, this is like a moment that just has these ripples that go over throughout modern WWE. You can still see the imprint and the impact of that power bomb, the triple power bomb through the table. And when these three lads came in, dressed all in black and started beating up Ryback, I was like, oh, for God's sake, it's another like screwy finish with some random nobody jobbers who are just going to beat up Ryback for this one match. And then the, the commentary started saying, oh, my God, that's Dean Ambrose. I was like, Wait, I know about Dean Ambrose. I've heard about him on these forums that I've been on. He's supposed to be involved in a few with Mick Foley over the summer and stuff like that. And then he said, that's Seth Rollins. I was like, I know him from NXT. And then I started getting really excited because I saw that this was a debut of a brand new faction. It created so many memorable moments, but really The Shield is synonymous on WWE being able to create three new stars. And this is something that WWE gets a lot of criticism to almost this day and it's always been the same for the past decade i was convinced like oh you know you get a brief little run undefeated whatever and then you lose and then you keep losing and eventually you become three and b like everyone's waiting for that to happen but it never did which is the incredible thing they gave the shield every advantage that you could possibly have. They inserted them into some of the biggest things. They had them working with the biggest stars in the company and they very quickly gave them triple championships. And look where it got them all. All three guys have been top champions in the company at some point in their career. And obviously John Moxley has gone on to basically walk in the door at AEW and become their champion, has led them for a year as their top guy. And uh, I think that, you know, my favorite Shield member uh, for the bulk of its run was Dean Ambrose because he was kind of the crazy one. I was shocked to find out he wasn't the leader of the group. I always thought he was. And then like when Seth Rollins turned on them, like, oh, he turned out to be the leader the whole time? Like, okay, I'll, I'll go with that for now. Like when he initially debuted, I was a big Seth Rollins fan. Uh, I love Seth Rollins from his time at Tyler Black in ROH. But as time went on, the the promo work of Dean Ambrose just made made me engaged. I think with, with Moxie now in AEW, a S.H.I.E.L.D. reunion feels like it would be a bigger deal at this point. I'd love to lie and say, no, they, 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 they're done now. You can't go back and nostalgia and wrestling is bad. I'd be up for it, of course. And no one can say that they wouldn't mark out if the S.H.I.E.L.D. reformed randomly somehow. But I've got to be honest, I've got no interest in ever seeing them reform again. They've done that storyline enough times with the various tag runs and the, the fist bumps backstage. I I'm happy with them to all be separate forever, but maybe they come back for a big three-person inter-promotional match when 
AEW starts working with WWE. So that never that that'll never happen. I am going to go out on a limb and I'm going to say that Survivor Series 1998 is the most perfect one night pay-per-view storyline ever told. Corporate Champion Deadly Games is one of my favorite uh, WWF pay-per-views of all time, Survivor Series 98. It's fantastic. So Survivor Series 98 is actually still my favorite pay-per-view ever. Deadly Game, man, that was like one of my favorite pay-per-views of all time. It's kind of like, I compared it when we did the review of it to The Sixth Sense, where if you know where it's going, the the building blocks of that story are presented to you plain as day but if you don't know where it's going the end can hit you like a ton of bricks i was a huge huge rock fan at the time i was really into his uh face turn i was less than a year into my fandom in 98 when the rock turned heel and joined the corporation and i was furious at survivor series when he won the tournament and joined up with the corporation i was so crestfallen i was like 13 years old i should have known better oh man corporate rock the corporation the corporate champion the rock turning on mick foley when you think foley was going to be mcmahon's chosen guy to win the wwf championship this is honestly it's not just a great moment it's arguably one of the greatest survivor series ever the rock wins the deadly games tournament to become the wwf champion i think what's brilliant about this story is that it seems like it's rigged from the start right you think that the corporation who are all at ringside are gonna mess up and and interfere and cost the rock the victory and instead they do interfere they do mess up the match and they do cost someone the victory but it's mankind and vince screws mankind out of the wwf championship it was stunning to me i was honestly very much surprised because the rock seemed like the perfect new baby face for wwf at the time i mean everything was there from the rock's motivation you know being upset that the people had you know originally said die rocky die and rocky sucks um that was there uh vince you know finding his new you know, perfect corporate champion. Uh, you know, there was never, a, mankind just wasn't realistic as a Vince guy. It's perfect. 1998 is one of the best years in the history of wrestling ever. Not only have you got the, the Mr. McMahon angle with Stone Cold, but when at Survivor Series, the corporation is properly founded, then Austin becomes even more an, of an underdog. The Rock gets to cut all of these amazing promos and has that killer presentation rock is so good as a heel and that cements him as the equal megastar just one year after the montreal screw job they wanted to do a similar thing and they've done it many times since it's like every time survivor series rolls around but this was so soon after so i guess there's like a there's there's definitely an argument to do it then if you're ever gonna do it. There have been a lot of attempts to recapture the magic of Survivor Series 97. And I think the reason why it works at 98 Survivor Series is because it's a self-contained story. You don't need to know what 97 is. You don't need to know what the Montreal Screwjob is for this pay-per-view to make sense. And for me, that's kind of why it works and why when you watch it, you're not like, ah, it's just the Montreal Screwjob, but again. So it's 1990 and it's Survivor Series and Ted DiBiase's million dollar team has been teasing that they've got a, uh, a secret final member. Back then it was like uh, assembling a Survivor Series team was just like assembling a new version of the uh, sort of the village people on steroids. And then they go like, and our final member, uh, and he's on the team because he's a heel, uh, he, he's a zombie man. Here he is. It's an undertaker, a literal undertaker comes walking out, uh, flanked by Brother Love. The, um, I, I wasn't watching wrestling when Undertaker debuted, but you know, you go back and watch it. And the, the thing that I always remember about like going back and watching it, so you know, the first time you see it on VHS tapes or whatever, is that Roddy Piper line. <laughs> Look at the size of that ham hock. Look at the size of that ham hock. <laughs> what does that even mean? So Undertaker's debut, uh, like 10 years before my time in terms of watching wrestling, but even looking back with hindsight, like we know Undertaker's a big deal now, but it's obvious that he's a big deal. It's just the way he carries himself. Like 
it's a silly gimmick, right? He comes out looking like some sort of dead cowboy with his with his little boots and his his purple flamboyant gloves. He's like a he looks like a dead prince. Um, he's oh, prince is dead. Like prince. The first time I saw the Undertaker wrestle, I was um, was kind of bored and and didn't really understand what was happening. I was just a kid. I'm just saying that, that what was coming to my mind. I wasn't that into the supernatural kind of stuff. I think the craziest thing about Undertaker's debut as well is that he had a, a short-term deal with WCW uh, during the summer up to September before he was told that he'd never draw a dime and people would never pay to see him wrestle. And then, yeah, he got brought in as The Undertaker and, you know, would become one of the most iconic characters in WWE history. It's just crazy to see how one person's perspective can be complete rubbish uh, compared to another person's and that person just happened to be Vince McMahon who'd pushed The Undertaker to the moon. He really found a way to inhabit that character that was different than seemingly basically everybody else. He slowed his pace down, not just in the ring, how he walked, everything, everything was so invested in creating this illusion that The Undertaker was this character. And I know that the real best version of The Undertaker is the dead man when he's doing his WrestleMania streak series with Shawn Michaels and Triple H and CM Punk, but I would be lying, I would be betraying Teenage Jolly if I did not say the American badass, the motorcycle riding, Limp Biscuit entrance musicking, bandana wearing, I'm gonna make you famous version of The Undertaker is my favorite. As far as why I think The Undertaker has lasted as long as he has and why he endured so much, I think a lot of the, the biggest reason is evolution. His character always changed as the years went on. And it's a simple enough concept that it isn't shoehorned into a gimmick. Yeah, he's The Undertaker, he's the dead man. But I mean, as we saw with like the American Badass stuff, that's pretty easily transferable. Like that could just be a cool nickname. Like he, commits to the character like famously he doesn't break character ever it's only now now that he's retired that undertaker started doing you know interviews out of character undertaker was the only one who was just like no i'm i'm a zombie wizard i'm a zombie wizard i don't have twitter or TikTok. i am a zombie wizard there's, I still don't think there's ever been a big person, a big guy wrestler, maybe maybe Kane, but a big guy wrestler who has as much kind of complete control over their own body, be able to go crazy violent and stop and pause and know exactly where the cameras are, and be in the right place and in the right position to create that lasting image. Even later in your career, when you're gonna do your best damn work, which he did from 2005 onwards. Yeah, I mean, that's why the Survivor Series moment is so uh, incredible because it it is a statement of intent from WWE. And apparently Mark Calloway, who would play The Undertaker, was worried that he would end up being the gobbledygooker. And at one point he thought he was going to be, which imagine, imagine that. The Montreal Screwjob was one of the biggest things ever to happen to the wrestling industry and it was where Vince McMahon decided to screw over one of the most loyal people that ever worked for him because he had the audacity to sign with another company. The Montreal Screwjob. What else could be number one on this list of Survivor Series things is 1997 is the year and Bret Hart and Shawn Michaels are facing off for the championship. So the Montreal screw job is what happens when uh, two wrestlers really don't like each other to the point where it's stupid and two companies don't like each other to the point where it's stupid. The Montreal screw job can be summed up in its simplest form. Brett is grumpy, Sean's a prick and Vince was wrong. I distinctly remember when I found out about the Montreal screw job. I was at a friend's house another friend came over and said, hey, did you hear what they did to Bret Hart? And I was like, no, what happened? And he kind of told me, you know, uh, what went down. And then I went home and got on the internet, read up on some details. 
And then I watched Raw the next night and 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 saw McMahon's interview, the the Brett screwed Brett interview, which you know pretty much gave birth to the Mr. McMahon character. So at the time, I didn't even know what what had happened. It wasn't until I watched Wrestling with Shadows that I was like, "Holy crap, this is crazy!" Like it was just a contract negotiation gone wrong, played out in front of like whatever twelve thousand people live, and then however you know a couple hundred thousand people at home or whatever it is. Bret Hart uh, thinking that he's actually going to be able to get one over on Vince McMahon, even though, uh, like, what, four years earlier at WrestleMania, 1993, WrestleMania 9, Vince McMahon allowed Hulk Hogan to just walk right back into the company, say, hey, brother, I want that title back. And then Bret Hart was just sort of screwed out of his title. So, I mean, it was kind of obvious. It should have been obvious to Bret that Vince was going to get what Vince wanted. The most infamous moment in all of Survivor Series history. I was a huge Shawn Michaels fan. So I was rooting for Shawn Michaels against Bret the Hitman Hart. Bret the Hitman Hart was also one of my favorites, but I always stood on the side of the ledger of Shawn Michaels. I rooted for him against Bret Hart in the infamous Iron Man match at WrestleMania 12. So I was still on Shawn Michaels' side when he went up against Bret the Hitman Hart at Survivor Series 1997. Vince uh, basically couldn't afford to keep Bret Hart. And I'm saying like, all right, Bret, look, WCW gonna pay you more money for fewer dates. Off you go. It's fine. You can go. And to make it, you know, even better, like I'm gonna honor the fact that, yeah, as you leave, you do get creative control on your way out, which was a thing that Bret Hart kind of pushed for when negotiating his whopping big contract with Vince in the first place. And so Shawn Michaels and Triple H essentially got in the ear of Vince McMahon and told him that, hey, the champion needs to drop the title on the way out, which is true. You know, the champion should drop the title before they go off to the competition. That was a, he'd been burned by Medusa going across to uh, to WCW and dropping the belt in the trash. So he, he kind of just didn't want that to happen again. What you don't want in the middle of a wrestling war is for your top champion to show up on another show with your top title, throw it in the trash or do whatever it was. So Vince decides to conspire backstage to put the belt on Sean at Survivor Series in 1997 in Montreal, Canada being the home country of Bret Hart. This is a disaster. This is a powder keg that they are just waving a lighter nearer and nearer as they come up with this plan. We'll give the belt to Sean. It'll go fine. Where are we going to do it? We're going to do it in Montreal. It's the last chance we have before he goes to WCW. It's always going to go terribly wrong. Of course, what happens? Uh, Sean Michaels locks in the sharpshooter on Bret. Uh, Vince tells Earl to ring the bell. Uh, Earl signals the bell to be rung. Earl, Earl f off because Earl's worried that Brett's going to kick the sh out of him. Uh, Shawn Michaels pretends he's not in on it, even though he is. Um, Brett loses his fruit on t on pay per view, does the WC thing and spits in Vince's face. It was this perfect storm of these three ideals of Brett not wanting to lose in Canada, Brett not wanting to lose it to Sean, and Sean wanting to beat Brett in a way, I suppose, because Vince had played them off against each other for years, like in the locker room and stuff. They'd had a fight in the locker room. And like Vince was fueling this fight. He was fanning these flames because it made for good television when they would go out and cut promos on each other and have their matches. It was just basically a situation where Brett had his position. He didn't want to lose to, to Sean. You know, he had another month with WWF after Survivor Series that he could have waited to another pay-per-view and dropped it then. And then you had Vince, who just wanted Brett to drop the belt that day, uh, apparently to Sean, and they were just so entrenched in their own positions that Vince had to pull the move to, to, to forcibly take the belt off of Brett. Yeah, Vince was wrong in cheating Brett. He could have gone about it a different way. I don't necessarily think that, you know, Bret Hart wasn't going to go to Nitro the next night and with the WWE Championship, okay? He wasn't going to do that. He still had about a month left on his contract. I know that Bret Hart was willing, uh, willing to put over, you know, Austin or Shamrock or even The Undertaker. He could have done it that way. I know that he was even willing to put over Shawn Michaels if Shawn Michaels would return the favor, but because he wouldn't, that didn't necessarily happen. If Vince was that scared, and he had every right to be. I know we can, we can say, but you know, there was this clause in the contract, he was legally unable to do it. But WCW was more than in a position to absorb those legal costs 
and it not matter a dime to them and WWF would just be the morally right company going out of business. Vince became Mr. McMahon and Mr. McMahon was opposed by Austin and Austin versus Mr. McMahon is one of the greatest money earning feuds in all of wrestling. So yeah, it, it's the probably the most important Survivor Series moment of all time and one of the most important moments in wrestling, I think, of all time.